Good evening everyone, uh, welcome to Tom Plays Chess for Absolute Beginners. It's uh, <laughs> might be uh, not much to look at, probably a lot of talking for this, but uh, I just thought it was worth doing. Chess is a totally valid strategy game, one of, one of the earliest ones. Started in India somewhere, this is technically Western Chess. We normally just call it chess in Europe, in the West in general, but um, the game overall started around India, moved West and East, and you'll find the Eastern games are quite different. But yeah, this is the one we normally just call chess, and I've just loaded up a computer game. You can get quite cheap computer games on Steam for it, because lots of people have made them. But getting computers to play chess is kind of a time on a tradition and as of um, just before the turn of a millennium they're officially better than humans <laughs> but a lot of the modern ones are programmed to make mistakes so don't be intimidated you'll usually be able to beat them with a bit of practice so yeah I'm just gonna try and go through it as we play just the initial starting thing um, oh this particular game is chess ultra which I've gone for. No particular reason, it's usually much prettier than this as well. So, you know, apologies to the artists who put so much effort into making it prettier. I had to lower the graphics because my computer isn't that good. And it has to record at the same time. But normally you'd be able to get a much prettier board than this and lots of options and things. But I'm really just interested in the basic chess game for today. So I'm just playing a sort of average computer level and when you're playing on the computer you don't have to worry about setting the board up but if you are playing at home then it is something you need to do so there's a couple of pointers to that to start with the sides are usually called white and black as other squares as you can see they're often not white or black like especially if they're carved from wood which is what this is intended to portray they're often different shades of brown but one side will always be darker than the other so we call the lighter side white, the darker side black, and ditto for the squares. So when you're setting the board up, whichever side you're on, you should have a white square in the lower white corner. And your queen, which is this piece, the most powerful piece, should always be on the square of your colour. So because we're playing white, she is on the white square. So you'll find that that means you're looking at something slightly different depending which colour you're playing. And beyond that, it's just queen and king in the middle, then the bishops, then the knights, then the rooks, which are also known as castles, because they, well, they kind of look like towers, but I suppose to most people's minds look like castles, and the pawns, all in front. Okay, I think that's basically all you really need to start the game. So, if you start as white you get the first move which actually gives an advantage it's a known issue with these kinds of games the first move advantage and in chess there isn't really anything that counteracts that so whoever plays as white has an advantage which is why I've kind of chosen white for this one so I'm gonna start with probably the most basic classic opening move this particular game actually shows you what legal moves you can make not many on the back row, as you can see, because everyone's hemmed in by the pawns, with the exception of the knights, which we'll come to later. The pawn can move one or two spaces directly forward. Normally it would just be one space, but in Western chess there's an option for the first move of the pawn to be two squares instead. You do have to be careful with that. It's designed to allow you to come to grips with the enemy faster, you must not use it to avoid fighting an enemy pawn. Otherwise, they can just take your piece anyway. I doubt we'll see that. It's called um, pass on, but <laughs> it is a rule. So if you have a pawn here, do not try and move two spaces forward to avoid being taken because they can just take you anyway. I mean, you can try it, but it is, there's a, they have every right to just take you anyway. Anyway, so we're going to move two spaces forward. Okay, and they've done a not entirely unusual move in opposition. 
So the reason I've done this move, the reason it's such a classic, is for one thing, one of the basic strategies you want when playing chess is to try to dominate the centre of a board as much as possible. The pawns, even though they move forward, and in fact can never move backwards, which is unusual, most pieces can move back and forth at will, they actually threaten, they attack diagonally, only forwards again, but a piece here is actually completely safe from this pawn. So they could have moved this pawn forward and blocked us. As it happens, they haven't done, but often that would be the classic counter. But we would be attacking, threatening those two squares. Okay, so in most, well, in every other piece's case, the square it shows in red is also the square we're threatening, even though it's only showing the square we can move to. But with a pawn, it's important to remember that the square in red is where it can move to, and we're actually threatening these squares. Many chess games may not have this red square anyway. This is just a help that this chess ultra game has put in, which I thought was worth leaving in. So as well as dominating the centre of the board, the other reason I've done this is that it frees up the bishop and the queen. The bishops always move diagonally, and they can move any distance. So our bishop is now threatening all of these squares all the way along there. The queen can actually move forwards and backwards as well. That's what makes her so incredibly powerful and valuable. But at the moment, she's obviously hemmed in by other tr troops. So our pawn moving has freed her up to threaten these areas. Okay. So, so much to progress. So for the next move, one of the things we will often try to do, especially with pawns, is use them to protect each other. Uh, this pawn at the moment is completely unprotected. If the enemy was threatening that pawn square, which they're not at the pr at present, but they probably will do soon, they could just take it and there'd be nothing we could do about it. So usually what you do is you get another piece to threaten the square that your piece is in and it counts as protecting it. What it basically means is if the enemy takes it, you will take them back. So in this case, I'm not going to use a pawn yet to protect it, partly because it will block in our queen and bishop again. If I move either of these pawns forward, it will block in the opposing piece. So I'm actually gonna move a knight. Knights are the one piece that can jump over other pieces and they both move and threaten in a kind of L shape. As you can sort of see there what they're threatening, this one can move to free spaces now. So we also technically <laughs> allowed the knight an extra square, but the knight doesn't really need it because they're not hemmed in. So if I move this knight to here, it's now protecting this pawn. The game doesn't actually show it, but it does show the places the knight can move to, and the ones which aren't highlighted are the ones with our pieces in. So it's technically protecting our queen and this pawn now. For that reason as well, you'll note that a knight is threatening far less pieces when it's at the edge of a board. So ideally, you want to keep your knights away from the edges. <laughs> Basically close to the center, because they're far more dangerous if you do that. So I'm actually going to move the second knight out, even though this actually does block the queen a bit. Okay, so between the knights and the pawns... We are now in the centre attacking all of these squares and the one with the pawn actually in. Note that the knights are also protected by pawns and also by a queen in this case. Right, I think I'm definitely going to have to start moving pawns forward. They're clearly gearing up for some kind of pawn related attack. So I'm going to move this pawn forward just one to protect this pawn. Unfortunately, I have now handily hemmed in my bishop. So they're now moving their knights. Now they've probably got a particular aim in mind with moving the knight there rather than here because the knight's still near the edge of the board. I would imagine they're planning to move the knight there. And what they're probably thinking is that I will take their knight with my knight, they will move their pawn here, which will free up their queen to attack all of these squares and allow them to dominate the board. And to be honest, they're probably right. I probably will do that. Although I'm now questioning whether I should, because that's clearly what the opponent is going for. 
which is where <laughs> chess can get tricky. It's why we sometimes put a timer on because you can end up sitting there trying to outthink your opponent. And ideally, you should try and think several moves ahead at all times. It's interesting, and I don't want to sit here thinking for ages, so I'm probably going to be at more risk of losing because I don't want to have everyone sat there waiting while I sit here thinking. So what I am going to do is, apart from dominating the board, another move that is worth doing is trying to clear space between your king and the rook on either side. Okay, so it's most easily done on this side. You'll see why when we get to it, but I'm just going to move this bishop out, even though it doesn't seem like a very good move, simply to clear some space. Okay, that's interesting. I did not expect the queen to do that. So what the queen's doing here, I think, is known as pinning. A very, very basic attack, but it is one to watch out for. It basically means that you move a long range piece, it's always a long range piece, into a position where rather than actually attacking the piece it's obviously attacking, you're really attacking the piece behind it which is more valuable. In this case it's the king which is the most valuable piece. If I lose the king I've lost the game. So what the queen's actually doing here is I cannot now move this knight. So all the protection I've got in place with this knight has just become null and void as long as my king's there and the queen is here. I basically can't move it. So you'll sometimes find an opponent will think they, they're still protecting these squares and they're actually not. Because I wouldn't even be allowed to move this knight. You're not allowed to let your king be taken. There's a whole thing about check. You're not allowed to move into check, which means your king could be taken. You're not allowed to leave your king in check, which means your king would be taken next move. So I would literally not be allowed to move this knight by the rules of the game. However, it's not a problem, because what I was trying to move up for with moving these is another special move called castling, which is intended to protect your king. So you can do it either side. In some ways, it can be quite nice doing it on the queen's side, because the rook ends up in the centre of the board which if you remember we're trying to dominate but it's much easier to do on the king's side because there are only two pieces to move out of the way so having done that we can select the king normally the king can only move one square in each direction you can see here we seem to be able to move a king two squares that's only because we're doing the castling move the king will go here the rook will go here on the other side the king would have gone to where the bishop is and the rook would have moved to where the queen is which you do have to watch because that would have left that pawn undefended. At the moment it's defended by the rook. You'll have to take my word for that for now. But if we move a king here, the computer will automatically move a rook for us. Okay. So that knight is no longer pinned because there are no valuable pieces beyond it. And the queen herself is so valuable that she can only realistically pin a king or an undefended piece. Because if we move a rook there, it doesn't matter if she takes it, because we will just take her. Now, I'm assuming she's now threatening this pawn, which will only be a valid threat if we move a bishop. I suppose this is a variant on pinning, where if we move our bishop now, so we're threatening all these squares, but if we actually make good on that threat and move a bishop, she can instantly take this pawn. Now we could try and defend the pawn by moving forwards, but if we do that, the knight is no longer defended, and the queen will take the knight. So that's really a non-starter. At the moment we probably just have to be aware of it, or actually do we? Potentially better option might be to move this pawn one forward so we threaten the queen, because at the moment she's not in a position to take either of these pieces nor can she move into either of these squares. So if we move our pawn one forward, she'll be forced to retreat. There we go. So they basically wasted two moves, which you should always try to avoid in chess. They moved the queen there and then moved the queen back. That really is terrible. You should never do that if you can avoid it. Every move should be valuable. It should be either taking a piece, it should be moving your piece into more powerful position so if you're forced to move back that is genuinely a failure okay right 
I need to try and work out what they're actually going to do next. I mean, in some ways, I'm almost inclined to press the advantage and try and corner their queen. But then maybe, I'm not sure we're really in a position to do it. So what I'm thinking I might do instead is move a rook into the center. Because even though there's a lot of blockage here now, we're likely to end up with a big pawn clash in the center of a board. So having the rook there could actually be quite useful. And basically it means the queen is now pinning the knight again. But I'm not worried as long as the rook is protected. Which it currently is by both our queen and by this knight. Although I might want to move a knight to free these up. So we shall see. It looks like they're trying to move their bishop out here somewhere. It's interesting. Okay, I think I might move our pawn out here because they'll probably take it with their pawn, but that then makes this a nice open entry for either the queen or the knight to go into. That should open up the board a little. Interesting. <laughs> I actually did not expect that. Okay. Okay. Different. So presumably that knight is trying to prevent us moving there? They really think I was going to do that? Or they're also threatening this pawn which is only defended by this knight at present. Can't say I'm desperately scared by that. I think I'm just going to take the pawn. I'm guessing they'll use the queen. To... Oh no! Okay, I'm inclined to think that was a mistake as well because they've left this entire front row open for me to attack. Hmm. Nice, okay. So you see the queen is now revealed in her ability to move backwards and forwards. I think I'm going to move the queen there, partly to protect this pawn and sort of dominate this area, even though it's a little risky putting your queen out, but hey, they did it first. And also because the bishop's then kind of backing her up. It does mean the rook then only has this knight for protection. But let's see. Okay. Another interesting move. So that knight is going to be threatened the second I move my knight. Does rather make me wonder what they think they they're going to achieve with that move. Could move a knight there, but this knight will take it, so that's no good. Go there, but the pawn will take it. I'm just thinking about moving the knight. An obvious place to move our knight would be here. It's a bit near the edge of the board. And it's threatened by this rook, but it is protected by this bishop, but it is protected by our bishop. Or we could just not move a knight at all, because I'm honestly not sure what they're hoping to achieve with that. Might move a bishop here. So that way we will threaten their queen if this knight moves. If actually she's seen it coming, she's already moved there. Well, partly she's actually moved there because she's threatening this pawn, which is fair enough. We do need to do something about that. I would love to have this rook in the middle if at all possible. I suppose I could just 
head straight out and try and force an exchange of queens. I'm kind of hoping this is actually making some kind of sense. So hopefully you've picked up roughly how the pieces move. The bishops are all the way across the board diagonal. The rooks are all the way across the board forwards and back. When we're not being hemmed in by pawns, the queen is like a combination of a bishop and rook, which makes her extremely valuable. You should never exchange a queen if you can help it, except for another queen. And the knights, as we've we've gone through the knights and the pawns, and the king is kind of like a really lame version of the queen, only moves one space, but in any direction. So I'm actually wondering whether it's worth exchanging my queen for theirs, or at least scaring them off. So she's not threatening our pawn. We're in danger of losing our only protection on this pawn, but nothing is currently threatening it. So let's just see what they do. They might just exchange. No, they will not. They've actually gone for castling. Okay. Curious. See, I never actually have a problem with exchanging equal value pieces. Especially because it will actually mess up their pawn slightly. It'll free up the bishop, but it will mess free up the rook. I keep doing that. But it actually messes up the pawns a little. So they've got two pawns on the same row, same column, which is... I don't know, it won't mess them up. They can take it with um, a knight. Fair enough. I'm just wondering if there's anything I could get out of this instead. Nothing major, I don't think. Okay. Let's do it. They've chosen to mess up their pawns. I am perplexed. Right, so I'm going to do what I was wanting to do and move my second rook into the centre. So the rooks are now protecting each other. In an ideal world, you can actually try and get one behind the other so they can protect each other across the length of the board. Hmm. The bishop out. Oh, I see. They're threatening this piece. No, because this knight will protect that piece. So we don't really need to worry about it. I can move my knight in order to threaten the bishop. Need to remember that this pawn is unprotected though. Okay. Not exactly the response I was expecting. Right. Let's threaten this knight. Okay. So, I think I mentioned at the start that uh, computers are sometimes programmed to make mistakes these days. I think this is an example of that. I would never have done that move. So there's a, there's a kind of exchange rate of pieces. Pawns are the least valuable, and as far as I can tell, they basically just exchanged a pawn for a knight. Yeah, they haven't done anything amazing that's made me think, oh no, I fell for a trap there. So, yeah, that was a surprisingly bad move on their part, which has put us ahead. In fact, I'd kind of argue that's lost some of the game. <laughs> well, there you go. So, yeah, the rough um, exchange hierarchy, I would say that pawns are least valuable, then knights... Some people have occasionally, I've heard arguments that knights are as valuable as bishops. I think that's only kind of true at the start of the game. And the thing is, as the game goes on, the bishops become more valuable because there are less pieces blocking them. So generally I'd say pawns least valuable, then knights, then bishops, then rooks, then the queen, and then the king. The king's only really valuable because it's game over if you lose him. Is not that effective a piece. I have a horrible feeling I'm actually going to do what I said you should try to avoid doing and move this knight back. Because I don't have anything useful I can do with him up here and I need to protect this pawn from this knight. 
that's what I'm going to do that. If nothing else, I can relax at least a little now because they've thrown away a knight, more or less. I'd quite like to move that pawn there, but I think, would it be threatened to you? I suppose it wouldn't be, it'd only be that bishop threatening it and I'd be protecting it with a knight. But then is there anything to actually be gained, apart from forcing that knight to move again? Which, to be fair, is a gain in itself. Why not? To force the knight into a less advantageous position. Which is always good. But it also means this pawn is now being threatened by both knight and bishop. Which is not so good. I really could do... Oh, actually, I've got no pawns that can possibly protect this pawn, have I? Okay, then. So it's not ideal, but I'm going to move this bishop up. It does have the advantage that this rook is now freed up to threaten this entire back row. Not sure what they gained from that move. Hmm, curious. So one thing I'm thinking is I'd quite like to move this forward, get this rook behind them, so they're backing each other up, which can be very powerful. But then we also have to think about... ...being more efficient. I'm kind of inclined to move this bishop there. It will be protected. That knight's currently being protected anyway, and it means we can kind of pin that knight against the rook. Not seeing any obvious disadvantages of doing that. Ooh. Okay, they are threatening our position of power at the moment. And also defending the knight. Yeah, they're thinking I'm after the knight. Really not that concerned about the knight, I have to say. So what would happen if I move my bishop here to threaten their rook there? We're no longer protecting his pawn enough. Actually, no, maybe we are, because we've got the rook protecting it now. They might move... So in theory, they should be scared of me taking the rook, even if it's protected, which it actually isn't. I wonder if they might do that, but that means I can just simply take it... Okay. Right. <laughs> I'm starting to think I should have put this computer on a higher difficulty level. <laughs> it's just throwing a bishop away as well. Yeah, that's not really a very good um, example of how to play a decent opponent. Never mind, right, so I can't take that pawn's now threatening us, and I can't take it because the bishop is defending it, or can I? Sorry, the knight's defending it. Actually, I probably can, because if the knight moves, the rook can instantly take their rook. So actually, that's a good move. Ah, yes, I've seen that, so they haven't taken it. Which is fair enough. But with that in mind, they've now gone down to only protecting that knight with the bishop. So if I take the knight, I'm now threatening both the rook and the bishop. That's another basic move called a fork, where you attack two pieces at one time. It tends to mean that only one can get to safety. So they've taken my piece, but I'm not swapping a knight for a bishop because I can instantly move up and take their bishop as well. So I'm now a knight up. It also allows me to do that move I've been wanting to do, where I have two rooks on the same column. So rook, I think, is an old word some variant of Indian for elephant, which made a bit more sense.
because you wouldn't get castles moving as a rule. Hmm. Okay. So we need to press the advantage. We've got a considerable peace advantage here. But you should never let your guard down. Our king is quite exposed. Of course, so is theirs. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. One thing I would never do is pass up an opportunity to mop up enemy pawns. Because pawns can become quite valuable in the end game. So if you see a pawn that's completely undefended, that you think you can take without any repercussions, it's generally worth doing so. I see they're going to take that pawn. I'm inclined to think not if you value the lives or not, but we'll see. Okay. Right, so when you move into a square that threatens a king, that's check, and they have to fix it. So back in check, it obviously shows it with a red line here. It's a bit unfortunate because I could have threatened that rook by moving the knight, but unfortunately the king will just take it if I do that. So it's not really a good option. Might move a bishop there, even though it's less powerful there, it is protected by the king. And the king can do a fairly good job of protecting people. As a rule. I'm also going to try and bring the knight into play. I'm effectively ignoring these pawns, which is risky, because I'm allowing them to mop them up. But let's see. We are threatening quite a few squares now. I wonder just how many problems we can cause for them. Hmm. The king's now threatening the rook of course. very safe way to hang around and moving over here to protect this pawn so one of the things about the end game is that if you can get a pawn to the other end of the board you can turn it into another piece realistically that piece is always a queen you're never gonna well <laughs> very rarely gonna make any other piece other than the queen but it tends to mean that moving a pawn towards the other side of the board is considered threatening in itself as you can perhaps see. Right. And they're of course doing exactly the same threat. Don't, I think they've actually backed themselves into a corner. So they're in a position where they can get a queen next turn, but I can instantly take it. They're protecting the pawn at the moment to stop me from taking it for now, but that means their rook is tied up and cannot easily get to this row to stop me from getting a queen myself. So I think they've managed to successfully scupper themselves. Oh, nice. Check. See, they're getting a bit desperate now. Check again. Yes, well. It's 
So you can choose any of these, but a queen has the ability to the rook and the bishop. So I can only think a knight would be an alternative, and that would only be in the most extreme of circumstances. Okay, so we've effectively won the game now. So the next thing we need to do is try to force checkmate. I'll just get rid of this pawn just to be on the safe side. So the one thing you do need to be extremely careful of is stalemate. If I move my queen here, it actually wouldn't be a draw because they can still move a pawn. But even so, yeah, actually that should be fine. I'm going to move my queen there to protect it. Okay, so what actually happened there is it's something you should go for if you're losing is stalemate. Checkmate basically means that the king is in check, the king is in threat and cannot get out of it. Stalemate means the king isn't in threat and cannot move without going into threat, into check, which is actually what would be the case here now. However, it applies to the entire board, so as long as there's another piece that can move, you can't claim stalemate and it isn't a draw. Okay, so because they could still move that pawn, it was safe for me to move there. If that pawn hadn't been existed, or if it had already been where it is now, my moving there would have caused a draw in a game that I was clearly winning. As it is, if I move my queen here, that should be checkmate. There we go. So I hope that made some kind of sense. It was... <laughs> the computer was a bit disappointingly not very sensible. But, um, yeah, and it might give an idea of some of the more basic strategies and, and how one goes about playing. Clearly, um, needed a higher level with this computer because it seemed a little bit keen to throw pieces away. I think when I was learning, computers were a bit too stupid to make mistakes, whereas they've got much more intelligent now. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that was uh, <laughs> in any way entertaining, if it was too much talking. Or if I just went on ahead and didn't explain stuff enough, I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, it's a little different. So, yeah, that is um, how I go about playing a basic game of chess. Might do another one later playing as black, although it really is very much the same, certainly when I'm doing it. Whereas, obviously, um, there are a lot more advanced techniques you can use, a lot of opening moves you know, defences and things, gambits, which you can always look into. But the basics are roughly that. You try to protect all your pieces, threaten as many pieces as possible, dominate the centre. Castle usually is a good idea. And mostly it's about observation. You want to stay alert, you want to make sure you're always watching which squares your opponent's threatening, which squares you are. Keep an eye out for pins, which could mean that threats aren't real and keep an eye out for things like forks and on the very basic level that should help you with uh, <laughs> certainly a computer opponent of this standard because they, they seriously need to up their game it would appear so yeah that's it anyway thanks for watching and um, I was currently waiting for uh, an update for one of the other games <laughs> I tend to do I was kind of hoping this would last um, a few weeks but the computer was a little easier than I thought so yeah, not sure what we'll do next week, but uh, whenever I next do a video, I will see you then.